Thanks, Adele. Um, as Adele said, we're absolutely honoured to have two amazing speakers this morning. I'll introduce you both to them. Um, um, Pam McFarlane and Emma Semenzi. Um, Pam is an author, she's a coach, and she's a trainer of early years educators. Uh, born in Zimbabwe, raised in South Africa, and settled in England in 2002. She founded her business, um, Enrich Coaching for Educators, to offer a solution for unmet wellbeing needs in the industry. Um, she teaches children from two to 18, but for the past 14 years, um, she successfully managed earlier settings in beautiful Brighton and Hove area. Her passion is coaching clearly and training early as educators wherever she's needed in the world. And she's been to a lot of countries from the Philippines to Ethiopia. Um, on a personal level, she loves natural beauty. She's even walked the Great Wall of China. She's climbed Mount Snowden. Um, she's done a hiking marathon on the South Downs. And I'm really interested in this bit, Pam, but she's indulged in Mongolian wrestling in Ulaanbaatar, which I, I, my mind is boggling on that. So I'm looking forward to hearing about that. <laughs> um, Emma Semenzi, um, she's our earliest practitioner who's going to speak with us today. And she's worked with Pam for a few years. Um, she was born and raised in Italy, very large family, four sisters, aunties, so constantly surrounded by children, which is where her love of, of childcare really started. She moved to Brighton Hope, 17 years old, and she learned English at an English school, worked in hospitality, studied level two childcare, work her way up, worked her way up from, from level two to level three in a little home from home setting in Hove. And in the four years that she was in the nursery, she progressed from level two to level three to, to, uh, to team, deputy team leader. And now she's the team leader of the room that she works in. Um, she's now studying level three leadership and management and working full time. And she enjoys walking on the beach and reading. And she's just found a new passion for painting by numbers during lockdown. So again, looking forward to hearing about that. Um, so without further ado, um, I'll do Pam's slides for, for her and uh, I will introduce you and take her to Pam. Over to you, Pam. All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me and, uh, and Emma. Um, I hope this is going to be useful for you. We're going to have just the first slide uh, and then I'll do um, a wee bit of talking. Thank you, Gail. Can you hear that? Can you hear that, Pam? No. <laughs> yeah. Started swimmingly. <laughs> there we go, a little bit. Okay, the music stopped on my side. Okay, that's a shame. Never mind. I won't sing because uh, that would be awful. Um, <laughs> but I'm sure you know the song. It's the song all about you. Um, so really, this is what today is all about. It's all about you. And uh, we're going to... Today you we <laughs> We'll stop that there, I think. <laughs> yes, so... As I said, started swimmingly and seamlessly, which is fabulous. Um, <laughs> it is all about you today. And I know that everybody pours so much into others, into children, into your staff, into your colleagues. Um, but today I want you to really take time aside um, and realize this is all about you and it's about others, but let's look at ourselves as well. Um, thank you for all your intro, Gail. Um, that's pretty much it. I, I have a deep love for early years, um, and I must say, um, staff and children are the same in the world. <laughs> staff and children are the same in the world over, whether they're in Ethiopia or South Africa or Hong Kong or wherever you go. Um, I'm a wife. I, I'm Mrs. McFarlane III. 
uh, we met in a public toilet, uh, but that is a story for another time. Um, I'm a mother of three adult children, two of whom are autistic and uh, one son um, passed away five and a half years ago. Um, I've been in education, as Gail says, for over 40 years, uh, and I started in rich coaching because I saw the need, I saw what um, I see what happens on the floor. I see what happens with people. And especially after what we've been through, I think we all need a bit of well-being um, cheer. So how well is your being? What does well-being mean? So Tishi Davis says that you can read it here with me. Well-being is the experience of health, happiness, and prosperity. It includes having good mental health, high life satisfaction, a sense of meaning or purpose, and ability to manage stress. Now, stress can be positive and negative. So we've got good stress, which is really motivating. It makes us do things. It puts a good pressure on us. There's also bad stress, and that bad stress is really demotivating. Um, and we, we are affected badly by that kind of stress. When we go deeper, it's like, if we have the next slide, please, Gail. We can look at uh, the multidimensional meaning um, of well-being. And as I, as I go through these um, fairly briefly, I want you to think about yourself. Where do you fit into this? Uh, and, and how are you before we talk about other people? So physical, uh, this includes lifestyle choices and our activity and how we will affect our personal well-being. Emotional, psychological, this is our ability to cope with everyday life and reflect how we think and feel about ourselves. It's a really important one. Social, it's all about a sense of belonging and social inclusion, where we communicate with others, our relationships, our values, our beliefs, lifestyles, and traditions. And they make up the social well being we feel. Spiritual, and so this is about meaning and purpose in life. Do you have a meaning? Do you have a purpose in life? Do you know why you're here? Um, and that's achieved through being connected to our inner self, to nature, or even a greater power. Um, um, and such as ordinary the faith that we know, or however you express your faith. Intellectual. It's important to gain and maintain intellectual wellness um, because our knowledge and skills are expanded and it makes life more interesting. Um, and this is one area that I really love because I think if we grow intellectually, our world is expanded um, and it's exciting stuff. Economic, economic wellness. Okay, so this is the ability to meet our basic needs uh, and feel a sense of security. Um, in this day and age, this is a huge issue. Um, and we get to hear some stories, uh, starting with maybe my stories and other stories just to show that all these things are real, they're going on now. Many of us have economic burdens um, and or emotional, psychological needs. And we're gonna look at that today. Right, slide four. Um, you are not alone. Now the Breaking Point uh, report, which was um, issued by the Early Years Alliance in 2021, said that 72% of the people wanting to leave the Early Years sector wanted to do so because of job-related stress. So if you're feeling stressed, you're not alone. But what we want to do is look at how we can manage that stress, how we can take away some parts of it, make it better, um, and even work with that stress. But uh, you're not alone. Others are, are, are really having a rough time at times. So um, we're in it together. And I think we know that. Right. So. You are not alone. And then slide five is all about keeping it real. And again, I'd like you to think about yourself. Where are you at in terms of this? Some of you are maybe doing really well. Uh, and if you are, then maybe look at somebody else near you that might be exhibiting these kind of these signs. So do you feel you've got too much to do? Maybe. I always did, <laughs> and I had to have steps to make that um, manageable. Feeling overwhelmed with the amount of work that we have, feeling overwhelmed by the pressures of uh, the pandemic that's easing now, 
uh, feeling overwhelmed by life and that impact in your job? Do you feel undervalued? Right, you're working your soul out and you don't feel that you're being recognized or valued. Feeling tired or exhausted? That is a lot linked to COVID era as well. Um, but also it's an exhausting job we have sometimes. You know, dealing with children and parents all day long, five days a week can be really tiring because you're giving of yourself all the time. Do you feel unwell? Have you got a, a, a physical underlying illness or do you just feel unwell? And I know with long COVID, a lot of people are feeling unwell and they don't quite know why. Struggling with life issues. So we're going to look at some of these now. For example, toxic relationships, finance, home life. Um, and then the third, the last one we're going to look at in detail a little bit is your colleagues. And, you know, um, our colleagues are amazing people. We know that. Sometimes we work with people that we don't get on with or we feel that are distracting us. Um, and this, this happens in real life. Even though it's a wonderful sector, we do get people that, that don't help our mental health. <laughs> um, in brief, I've just called them people drainers, gossipers, chatterers, work avoiders, blamers, control freaks. So I hope you don't recognize yourself in those. <laughs> you might recognize other people, but we'll talk about that in a minute. So uh, we are still talking about our own well-being and I want to tell you some stories because we're all about oh not yet Gail we, we <laughs> pop back <laughs> we, we're all about stories and each of you have got your own story uh, I have got my own story um, so I'm going to say a little bit of what I felt in my life which impacted my work and hopefully you can identify with that uh, or some aspect of it right finance there was a time in my life um, when I was drowning with financial problems. Bills were unopened. They, uh, I couldn't face opening an envelope. I would feel my heart beating when the, when the doorbell rang in case it was the post office or somebody coming to take something away. Um, calls with unrecognized numbers used to send me into the stratosphere of stress. Um, and it affected every aspect of my life, including work. All right, so you carry these things with you to work, no matter how hard you try and hide them or work with them, they are still there. Um, fortunately, I was rescued literally by an organization and that's, I will detail that in the signposting um, a recap at the end, who sorted that all out for me within a couple of years. Um, but I know how that influences and affects people at work. So think of your colleagues, think of yourself. Um, things like divorce. Um, I went to work the day my divorce was granted and I didn't tell my manager. Um, that was a, a number of years ago now, but she was absolutely horrified that I hadn't told her. And uh, she was wondering if I was feeling out of sorts and I wasn't able to focus with the children, etc. cetera. Um, some of you have been through divorce. It's difficult to compartmentalize because you're with the children, but you, you can't separate the two. Um, so there was no point in me going to work actually on that day because I was used to everybody, um, but nobody knew. Right. This is sounding a bit depressing, but anyway, we'll pass through <laughs> depression. So I, I was, I was fantastic. I did it all. Um, I was happy. I was glorious. I was living the life, but I didn't. Um, and I hit the wall at thirty-eight. And many of you are around about that age now because you're doing everything. You parent, your mother, your wife, you this thing, you that thing, you do it all. You, you're soaring in your job, you pull yourself out, and suddenly, sometimes, you can't take it anymore. So I had a, a major physical and mental breakdown at 38, which means I live with clinical depression daily, and I have to self-coach frequently, sometimes every day. Um, but I've learned to work with it. But if you're suffering from that depression, it's going to impact your work or, it's, or one of your colleagues, if they're depressed, it's impacting the work and the setting. Family, um, that comes with its blessings and its, uh, <laughs> um, its stresses. Um, I have an adult autistic and ADHD child, is exhilarating and 
exhausting, it's joyful and stressful, it's relentless and it's rewarding, and you still got to come to work every day. Um, and I know many of you live with, with people that you care for um, or, or somebody who needs extra support. You carry that burden with you into work. Toxic relationships. Now, fortunately, I haven't had a, a toxic relationship, but it's really interesting to follow this. And maybe you can identify with this in your colleagues. Um, toxic relationships lead to depression, low self-esteem, a poor work performance and absenteeism. I found absenteeism was a real key to the, this kind of issue. Um, and these kind of people can be a star performer and then be a poor performer. And then they're star and then they're a poor, poor performer. And their ebbs and flows in their home relationships are mirrored at work. Uh, and I'm sure you've, you've seen that at times. Um, grief. Um, I won't spend too much time on this, but uh, my, my darling son died about five and a half years ago. And grief is, it flows through everything you do. There's no time limit on grief. We just have to carry on. There were days I couldn't face the future, never mind the setting. And my mental thought processes were very dark indeed and continue to be so for a long, long time. And I still had to work. So we had to find a way to, to work within that. And this is universal. So somebody, you or one of your staff will experience grief or loss. And we need to know how to, how to, how to face that, how to deal with that. And then colleagues, I've been blessed with very supportive colleagues. I have to say Emma is one of them. But there are times when certain co-workers can add to your sense of well-being in a really negative way. And I'm just going to do it in a kind of alliterate, alliteration way. Uh, forgive me if your name is mentioned. It's not you. It's just alliteration. So do you have a chattering Charlie. Somebody who wants to talk all the time while they're on the job. Tell you about the weekend, tell you about this, tell you about that, talk about Brexit, talk about Eurovision, whatever. You have a gossipy goatee. So they tell you all the stuff from gossip and sort of spread gossip around the setting, um, sort of sharing, sharing news, being kind, but not so kind. You have a lazy lolly and this person dislikes physical exertion. So there's no enthusiasm. They're like a limp piece of spaghetti and they need pushing to get things done. They need direction all the time because nothing seems to be coming from within. Another kind of person that you may work with is a uh, blaming Bertha because nothing's ever her fault. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. We cannot take responsibility, uh, can't take supervision because they just don't see what they, what they do. Then we have Frankie Flyer, who's a drama queen, and every single thing is a drama. Fly off the handle instantly. Um, you know, drama is the way to go. And there are many other types that we can mention. I hope you've recognized some of them and hopefully you won't have a lot of these kind of people, but it's really important to know how to work with personalities. Um, and I know us as a company, we, we do a lot of work around personalities and how to make the most of people and how to negate the, the lesser effective parts of their work ethic. Um, so I hope that's made an impact with you and I hope you've thought about your own circumstance and those of your colleagues in these kind of areas. Right, now we're ready for pop. Thank you. <laughs> pop, there it is. So pop is working on your own well-being at work. Okay, there's going to be two areas, working your well-being at work, most important, and then outside at work. And I know we're screaming through these things, but it's just an overview. So slide seven, next slide, please. It's about regaining control and pacing yourself. Now, a lot of this is to do with managers, but if practitioners, if you know how to do this from now, uh, it will revolutionize the way you, you go ahead. And these things seem so obvious, but they're often not done consistently. Prioritize, organize, and prepare. It's a nice little acronym. Prioritize. What is important? Is it urgent? What do I need to do now? What do I need to do next week? What can I do next month? Right? You need to prioritize because there are a hundred things that need your attention. 
Um, and those 100 things together in one big ball create that stress and that loss of control. Prioritize first things first. Put these on a timeline. What are you going to do first? And then organize. Organizing is really important. I've got a, a picture there of a, a messy desk and then a, a filing cabinet that's quite neat and tidy. I've been in settings where the left-hand picture is the norm. So you get the feeling that nothing is in control. Um, you get the feeling that uh, there's a panic going around. Um, the workplace is not calming. It's not conducive to thought. Um, and I want to challenge you to have a look at your personal setting, your personal desk space and your office and see what does it look like on first sight? Is there a, a sense of organization, control, purpose, or is it the sense of, ah, everything's going up in smoke? So have a look at that. Um, Timekeeping, just jumping across there, um, is really important. If you can't fit it in, don't do it. If you, if you make space for, a, an, um, say, for a Zoom call, get 15 minutes before to prepare, 15 minutes after to wind down. Use your timekeeping skills because that will help you organize and it will help you put your priorities in place. Again, it seems so obvious that people tend to, a lot of people tend to just firefight. So this is the day today, what's going to happen? And then, woof, it, it kicks off. Uh, this kind of preparation helps you to avoid that. Prepare. Now, I always say plan ahead, work forward. If I was in January, I'd be doing um, March stuff in my diary. Um, I'd plan out the entire um, the entire year on my diary. The keyword is diary. I would, if I had an example, for example, if I had a staff meeting down, then I would three days before that I would say, prepare for staff meeting, print out what is necessary. Okay, so you really look in detail at your diary, preparing for what's ahead. So nothing takes you by surprise. Not nothing. Most things don't take you by surprise. It's a very good trick to do, and a lot of people don't do that either. Have an overview of your year, overview of your months, put in everything that you need to do, uh, from tea parties to parents' meetings to um, um, appraisals, supervisions, diarise every single one um, and see if you can lay out your, your yearly life so it's prepared. So plan ahead, work forward. Um, and make it manageable and achievable. And you will get there. Again, this is something that we do training on um, because once you clock this, your stress levels will go down. Um, it's particularly for managers, but, but for practitioners as well, with your planning, uh, with your preparing for what you're doing in the class, with your reports, uh, with everything you have to do. Remember POP, prioritize, organize, prepare and diarise. Okay, thank you. Next slide, please. Right, so before I do this little bit, it's just a, a wee bit of a word for, for managers, really. Um, we're talking about all these life and work issues that affect staff and how we can be proactive in talking to them and coaching them uh, and helping them through. But also remember, we are working in a professional environment. You're not counselors. Um, and if some people keep coming to you over and over and over again for the answers to their difficulties or their problems or something's not right, uh, and that's what coaching does actually, it, it equips you to handle your own problems, um, but it is a professional environment and you still need to do performance management, there's still expectations of people. Um, to be professional. So just have that in balance uh, as well with everything else going on. Right, so managers, be aware of your life and work issues affecting your staff. That's just chatting, that's just talking, um, that's just coming alongside. Uh, and most of you do that anyway. Some staff are closed off and they might not reveal anything. But if you see work performance going down, um, maybe have a chat see where they're at. Also, be proactive at talking and finding solutions. So, so think about, you know, um, think about what you're going to say, 
think about your signposting for various things that could happen. There's a few things at the end for signposting. Have some sort of solutions available for you for various problems so that you've got a, a you know, you, it's at your fingertips for when you do talk to people. Have issues in the bud. Okay, so if you start seeing, for example, somebody being absent regularly um, for no rhyme or reason, particularly if it's after a weekend, um, nip it in the bud. Don't let it go on for three months. Nip it in the bud and say, what, what, what's going on and how can we get through this? Um, because the longer it takes, it's embedded in their behavior, the, the, the more difficult it is to pull back. And as a manager, Often you're the one that's at the uh, top of the, um, the setting and say the top, we will work as a team. Um, but, but you're the one that everybody goes to, right? The parents go to you, staff go to you, children go to you, uh, owners go to you. Um, and owner again, it, you know, sometimes you can't talk to anybody. But if you need someone to talk to or to coach you or to bring you cake, you make the first move if you can, okay? Be vulnerable. Um, and obviously you can't really talk to your staff about some things, find somebody else, but really get that support. And it's a very important point. Remember, if you are depleted, you cannot support others adequately. So make a plan. Practitioners, sort of all of the above as well in a sense, but also stay away from negative behaviors. You are a professional, you do a wonderful job. If you see negative behaviors affecting you, um, or having an impact, don't veer towards them. It's very easy to do that actually in a team situation, but just avoid them, move away from them and talk to your line manager if problems are affecting you at work. Really simple stuff, but, but remember these things. It will, it will really make a difference. Right, slide nine. These are just very, very quick. One technique to use in coaching is the I can principle. So some days you feel you can't do anything. You've woken up and this is one of those days. Choose three things you can do. So for example, if you do, uh, we can choose work things or home things. I can organize my online diary. Yes, I can do that because that's simple. I don't have to talk to anybody. I can do that. Today, I can write up the staff meeting agenda because I know what I want. That's okay. I can cope with that. I can do a peer observation because it's an hour out of my time and I have that time. Okay. Obviously, use smart goals. So what you do in, in the bad days or the crowded days, choose things that you can do. Don't focus on what you can't because, the, you know, that's fine. You would do what you can. If you can't manage these things that you've said I can, move it over to the next day. Don't put too much pressure on yourself. But just doing the I can says revolutionize so many of my uh, coaches because they actually start meeting their own goals. You celebrate each small step, you tick it off, you say, I did this today. I did my online diary today. Tomorrow I can do something else. Very simple, but practical if you write it down. Um, and we do, we do quite a bit of work around this as well. Um, so I hope that 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 resonates with you really. Um, and you can also do that with personal things. For example, if you're going through grief, sometimes it's really basic. I can get up today and have a shower. Okay. And if you if it's something else with budgeting, say I can get up today and I can open the one letter I haven't opened for three months. I can do that. Or even I can put that letter on my desk so that I can get to it later, right? Really simple things. What can you do in a difficult situation? And that's what you do. Right, well-being outside work. And it's time to breathe. Because what we do outside work affects what we do inside work. I love this picture of Tom Daly. Now, he's in the greatest competition of the planet. He's in between his dives, um, and he's sitting there knitting. Now, that is just fabulous. <laughs> that's his mindfulness. That's his way of dealing with things. Now, I encourage you to actually have a look at his knitting work. It's, it's astonishing. 
But to do that in the middle of a crowd, in the middle of that pressure and that stress, in the middle of COVID, because look at his mask on, he's knitting. Okay, he's learned how to manage his stress. Now, knitting, I started a scarf for my son when he was first born, like a little woolly, fluffy thing. Uh, I started when he was you know, about six months. But I've still got to finish it, and he's 38. Okay, so that is not my thing. Knitting is not my thing. Yoga, a lot of people like yoga. Um, I look like an arthritic giraffe because my knees are dodgy. I can't do the downward dog. And running or jogging, a lot of people do that. But I'm certainly built for comfort and not for speed. So what I do, my thing, is baking. There's one of my cakes there. I love baking because it's a mindful activity. You do this, then you do that, then you do this, then you do that, and this comes out, and there it is. Um, photography, nature walks. Uh, that's one of my flowers. I think I've got flower pictures in the thousands because it's a process. It's, it's spotting, and it's looking, and it's seeing the light, and it's um, capturing a moment. And then you're going home and then you're putting it on the big screen and then you're enjoying it again. And then you're posting it and you're sharing with, with others. Um, and that's my mindfulness. That's what I do. And I do them like taking medicine because I know it'll feel, it'll, I, I will feel better. So there are times when I, I almost gag just to be outside so I can breathe and then I feel better. And that's the way I manage my well-being outside at work, uh, outside work. So what is your thing? Sometimes we will say, oh, I'm too busy. I just I can't do anything. I'm still doing this, I'm doing that, whatever. Find one thing. What is your thing? Find it and do it because it will influence your work in your setting. Right, the last one is uh, just signposting, really. Um, and there are other signposts I can direct people to. These are ones I know of and have used and I know work. So this is really good for you to have uh, on tap for your staff, these and others, uh, so that you can direct them. Um, enrich coaching for educators, obviously that's, that's, that's me and my team. Um, and we are here to hear staff, to empower staff, to signpost staff, to equip staff, um, to get a, a really healthy work-life balance, which will enrich the setting. Ultimately, it impacts the children, so it's all part of it. Um, am I still there, Gail? Yeah, oh, there we go. Uh, finance, uh, CAP UK, uh, that's the one that helped me and I've uh, signposted many people there. Each one has turned their finances around. Um, so please contact them. Step Change is another one. Grief, uh, there's a Child Bereavement UK, which is brilliant, and also cruise.org.uk which is brilliant for grief as well. Um, and any other issues that you know affect your staff, it's some things like this in place. So really that's, that's a very quick run through overview on some wellbeing aspects um, within your setting. Um, and I hope it opens the conversation really because we, we couldn't cover anything in depth. But I hope it opens the conversation up. Thank you so much, Pam. That was amazing. I was just writing down some of these techniques. Uh, I love the, the idea of the pop one. I think you can kind of really see how it can help you come a bit more organized. Um, yeah. And the can attitude as well, you know, taking that and ripping that piece of paper, actually taking that last section, the negative part away um, yeah. and applying that. Um, so a, a lot of us are managers here today. So it's important to see how we can kind of change mindsets within our own teams. And yeah. um, we've had a few questions come through. Uh, one person said, what activities or things have you done with your staff to help them deal with their well-being? Have you used like yoga in your sessions or in your, what have you done as a few, as, as a kind of more practical um, experience? Yes. yes. Um, oh, we do many things. Um, I, when I was managing up until um, uh, end of January, um, every staff meeting we had, we had one once a month, every staff meeting had an icebreaker which was loads of fun. Um, it was also enriching because we'd add knowledge. Um, there was a section about what we were teaching, teaching about and taking the staff further. For example, if we're talking about deserts with the school, we'd talk about um, desert animals that we knew nothing about and to enrich our knowledge. 
uh, that sort of thing, or even a nursery rhyme, you know, you can take and, and, and learn things from that. Uh, so we'd enrich their knowledge. We'd have an icebreaker that was really a lot of fun, and Emma can maybe attest to that. Um, we also did um, voluntary outings. So, for example, we'd go to Sheffield Park, especially in the autumn, uh, which in, um, in this area is absolutely beautiful, all the autumn colours. Uh, we'd go shopping trips. We did really exciting shopping trips to, like, Bognor Regis, <laughs> just for people who wanted to come. We'd have um, tea dates. I would bring cake in every Friday um, for people. And, and food is a really simple one. Honestly, it really lifts spirits. Um, it adds pounds, but then you're doing your yoga and <laughs> running, so it should balance up. But food is a great one. So um, treat, treat your staff. Um, I would, we had a Facebook page and for staff, and what I would do is um, just acknowledge what staff had done and say, oh, this is a fantastic thing here, she's done that, he's done that, um, and oh, thank you, Alan, for this amazing group. If anybody wants to ask him about this, go ahead. So there was those communications all the time, building people up. Um, does that answer a little bit? About. Yeah, well, hopefully yeah, for me, that's brilliant. I love that. Um, we've got a few more. I'll ask one and I'll pass over to Gail. Gail um, one of the person said is, how do you manage different types of stress with staff? There are so many elements that can lead to stress and not, not everybody wants to, to or can talk about it. No, no, this is, yeah, this is what I said. So some people won't be open to it. Um, but as part of your performance management, your appraisals, your supervision, um, and anything else you've got in place, um, this needs to be brought up. Um, so if, if it's impacting your performance, if, if somebody's having their performance impacted by what's going on, um, you know, we need to have a frank discussion and say, look, this is not working. Um, can you tell me why? You know, can you share with me what's happening? If they say no, they just say what I would, what I used to do is just say, okay, um, if you ever need to talk, you need to come and speak to me, we'll go through it. But in the meantime, I still need to see your performance going, you know, in a steady upward <laughs> growth. Um, however, what I can do is I can minimize what I expect from you for a short while. Yeah. Mm. So if they, you, do you see what I mean? So yeah, yeah. Some of the pressure off of the things they have to do and then re look at it um, because you can't force it out of them. But in the end, if their performance does go down to such an extent, you know, you'll have to have a professional discussion. And again, you would say, if you share with me, maybe we can get through this, but otherwise I've just got to work with what I see. You know, because it's that balance with being a professional environment and the well-being of your children. Yeah. As you know, so you've got to have that balance. Brilliant, thank you. Um, this question was sent to us, um private as well. I think it kind of leads on and, and definitely um, you've alluded to that already, Pam, but it kind of is kind of a follow up really from, from the question Adele just asked. What, what can you do if you can see someone needs help and perhaps it is affecting their performance, but they're not prepared to do anything about it? Nothing you can suggest. Yeah. Um, they want to try or do. How, how, yeah. how do you move on from that? Yeah. I think it's really difficult with some people it will come to the point where even after all those steps are taken and you sometimes you have to give warnings because of performance you know and you have to go down that route the normal route that people will go down um and, and some will not be helped okay so you can't save everybody you can't help everybody um a couple of times what i have done is i have for example the one girl just kept on missing you know, just being absent for no reason. So I actually made an appointment to meet her in a coffee shop in town. Um, during the school day, when she was supposed to be in, <laughs> I, would, I, I went to meet with her. And at that point was the time when she told me what was going on. And she explained everything and just laid it all out. And I was able to say to her then, okay, we can work with this. If you come back and if you do these things and if you are consistent, you can't I'm going to have to let you go so you know so I've done that a couple of times where I've actually met them outside of work um, but beyond that you can't do anything 
that's the problem. That's the problem because you've got everybody else to look after as well. Um, but also having these signposts in the setting might help because they might just look at a, a link and without talking, might just go straight to that link. So it's important to have pamphlets, to have um, links, to have uh, like a school box full of, full of well-being pointers. So people can access that without talking. Thank you, Pam. Thank you. I really, I really hope that uh, that's helped and assisted some people. I've made lots and lots of notes. I think Adele has as well. So um, we will be sending out Pam's presentation afterwards. But um, from a so from a practical point of view now, I'm going to introduce you to Emma. I gave you an introduction earlier. Um, Emma, over to you. I'm really, really looking forward to uh, to listening how from a from a practitioner's point of view how you've dealt with and how you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis um, regarding well-being. Okay, hello everybody. <laughs> Can you hear me? You can hear me hi. Yeah. Good, good. Um, okay, so I got my little notes here. <laughs> um, very nervous, so get, uh, get on with me. <laughs> Let me go with the flow and see how it goes. But um, yes, yeah, so I have um, three major points that I wanted to talk through. Um, firstly, was um, how Pam was able to help me um, with the coaching, uh, how she coached me, how she was able to, you know, bring confidence in myself uh, in uh, this environment, especially coming from, uh, again, I come from Italy, I moved here when I was 17, um, and throughout uh, my years here, I was able to go to college, studying my level two. Um, then I did my level three in a, as an apprentice. Uh, I did that in a, uh, this nursery work at. It's called Home from Home in Hove. Um, finished my level three. I actually finished the, the August of lockdown. Um, so, you know, it was great. The last uh, like few, uh, I mean, it wasn't, but um, definitely like the time uh, away from work because of lockdown gave me the chance to finish early my course. Um, and I was able to do extra things on the side. So that was, uh, you know, a good development for me. Um, yeah, I love, um, I love children. I always loved them since I was little. Um, again, I have four, uh, four sisters, three oldest, one younger than me. And I had, by the time I was uh, three or four, I had already two, two nieces. So <laughs> again, always around children. Um, so yeah, no, I, you know, it's, uh, it's been a lovely experience to work with Pam. Um, and definitely, I will say, you know, my development and the fact that in the last three to four years, uh, I've went from apprentice to practitioner to deputy and then team leader. Definitely, you know, she was a big part of my development there too. So thank you, Pam. <laughs> um, yeah, so again, talking a bit about uh, what Pam has gone through in her PowerPoint. Uh, I took notes myself, <laughs> just like, oh, okay, yes, of course, this is it, this is it, yeah. Um, so one thing that Pam did from the moment she started at the nursery was uh, she created this open door policy. Um, and that's all about like, you know, uh, the relationship with staff. So what she did is this open policy was just saying, you know, if you need, if you need me, I'm there for you. Um, so that was like the main thing. I remember going through a phase uh, when I was still an apprentice where um, I would be, I, I was very stressful. And uh, I remember just going into the office uh, and just, uh, um, can I have a cuddle? <laughs> I think my Italian side needed affection. Um, I needed somebody to talk to. Um, and uh, I don't know if somebody feels like that, but you don't want to bring things from work or things you're stressed about anywhere as well outside to your family or to whoever you live with because you feel like, no, that's my safe space. I don't want to talk about it. But as well, this is work. So you don't, you don't really want to talk about it as well here. So it's very hard to find that balance. Um, so I remember, you know, just going in uh, in the uh, in the office and talking to Pam, and be like, Pam, I just need uh, five minutes. Can I talk with you? And uh, she would be like always uh, welcoming and open. So that's uh, definitely something I'm looking. Uh, I've looked. Uh, I've looked up 
to pump, a blue cloud to pump. Um, yeah, so again, talking a bit more about coaching, PAM helped me plan. Um, another thing that was hard for me coming from Italy, uh, well-being is not very talked about there, or at least it wasn't when I was 17. Um, now it's a bit more open, but, you know, back in the day, an example uh, that I have is I had um, this friend of mine and um, she was struggling a lot. Uh, she, we, were, we were in high school and she was just struggling a lot and she couldn't find out what was, uh, what was happening to her. Um, and she had the, she went through a lot of doctor's appointments. Uh, um, she went through, you know, so many exams. And uh, that was when we were 12, uh, 13, 14. In her 20s, she found out she had OCD. When I think it's something that you get a bit more quicker here in UK, or, uh, you know, it's more open, it's more talked about. So it's like, okay, I might, I might have that. When this friend of mine for years, she was just like, well, what is happening to me? So again, coming from my perspective, uh, coming here and, uh, you know, uh, learning or hearing so much about mental health and uh, stress and anxiety, you know, I've grown up to, okay, get on with it and that's it. So coming here and seeing that was just uh, such a big uh, open, eye-opening for me. It was just like, wow, okay. So of course I had to come from, okay, no, I get over things because that's the way I was teach to do or that's the way I've learned to do things to having uh, to understand how other people feel and how other people are different from me. So I had to, you know, learn the balance and learn how to support others. And Pam was such a big help in that because again, the way I was, uh, the way I, I learned was completely different to the way I learned here. Um, yeah, so that's, that is Pam. <laughs> She definitely, I mean, um, as she was saying, you know, um, job-related stress uh, is due to responsibilities. And I found that being a big thing for me. So as again, going up uh, on the stepladder, as we can say, um, I found to have myself more responsibilities, uh, like such as key children. Then uh, from uh, a deputy, uh, deputy uh respect that I had both key children and I had to do the job of my team leader when she was not there so you know it's a lot of extra thing that uh, you learn on the job um, and definitely you have to learn how uh, to work through them so that has been again a massive experience for me um, I will mention I am I am in the drama queen uh, side <laughs> <laughs> I think Pam I confirm really that. Yep. yep. <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, I'm not. I'm not dramatic in like the sense, you know, in the bad sense. I hope Pam, <laughs> you tell me. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, you know, um, definitely. If you need a laugh, um, you scare me, or you tell me something that uh, you know I might get a bit upset over, and uh, you see it in my face, or you see it by my movement that uh, you know I've just been dramatic. <laughs> So um, that was another thing we had to talk through, you know, how I can, uh, you know, have a, a blank face, uh, not showing too much emotions because you don't want, uh, especially like if you're hearing something from someone you don't expect uh, or you don't agree with, uh, it's always good to hear every, uh, somebody else's perspective or what their, their feel, uh, what their feelings are. So, yeah, it definitely it, that's been a development. Uh, going going forward on um now i mean talking about children and staff well-being i of course don't know what um everybody's experience has been through covid uh one thing we did in the setting me and pam used to work at together uh, was we kept the settles going even during covid of course the first month or so was the no <laughs> Like, and no thank you <laughs> we don't know how that's gonna go but afterwards you know we start to key, to have settles for key workers um and uh, yeah we were we would find uh, we find ourselves with the key person and the parent by themselves in a room and you know keeping their distance uh, but still trying to get to know each other because that's what we want to do in the settle is getting to know the child getting to know the parents to build a relationship um so that 
was good for us to keep the settled through. Um, one of the main difference was felt from parents, especially first time parents. Um, you know, uh, they had so many different opinions from uh, their uh, NCT groups. Uh, they have so many like outside uh, ideas and they felt this anxiety, of course, of, you know, of leaving their children during this such a, such a um, stressful situation because you didn't know what, what was going to happen with COVID. Um, so yeah, that was uh, the big difference. And what we saw is you will have those children where they were just very excited to come in and they didn't look back and others were they would not just let their parents and then uh, what we did with that we had to keep uh, kind of like longer settles happening and that's uh, brought a bit more stress so that brought a bit more concern like okay more people coming in and out how we're gonna handle it with the covid what's gonna happen because uh, back then I, I don't think there was any uh, you know uh, uh, any test for it so it was just a very nervous time. And, um, you know, we had to both think about parents, uh, children and staff well-being because there were, uh, there were staff that didn't want to come back because of COVID, because they felt unsafe. And that was the same with children and parents. So we had to work through that a lot. Um, what we did is during COVID, and we still do now as we work, is we, had, uh, we have monthly meetings. Uh, we have um, in the setting, we have a toddler room and a preschool, and I am um, the team leader of the toddler room. So what we do is we have uh, a monthly meeting within our rooms, our separate rooms. And then at the end of the month, as Pam was saying, we have it, uh, um, a, a team meeting all together. In this team meeting, we do, again, as Pam was uh, saying, uh, we do icebreakers. And that get you know everybody relaxed, everybody happy and smiling. And most of the time, as Pam said, this they're quite fun. Um, Pam made me the, do a, the pen, a penguin dance back in the day, uh, and during Christmas period as well, we had to do a whole show about Jesus uh, being born. So that was fun. <laughs> um, so you know, it's like all these uh, things that you do just uh, to smile and create the relationship with stuff. And that is uh, that has been great. Um, we're still doing appraisals and supervisions. And as Pam was saying, this is a good way of uh, keeping track of uh, how staff is and how is their well-being. I, uh, I believe everybody appraisals and supervision are quite different, but uh, you know, you have pretty much, I feel like you have the pretty much the same question. So how are you? How are you feeling? How uh, is your work? How is your work going? How is your life outside of work going? And then you talk about all the different development you want, uh, you would like, uh, they would like to uh, to do during their uh, during working at the setting. So that's very exciting. Being able to do that now as a team leader has definitely opened my eyes even more. So that's why uh, that's why I say you know you never stop learning, um, especially like in this job. <laughs> I feel like it's always it's always something more because it's not just about the children well-being it's as well about staff uh, as we've been talking through it um I mean I feel like I'm, I'm stopping right now because I've quite I've talked quite a lot <laughs> and I'm like uh, am I saying enough? Am I saying not enough? So I will stop here um thank you for listening. Thank you Emma. Thank <laughs> you so much. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for being so open and honest about your own experiences as well. And I think, I think as practitioners, I think we all need a Pam. I think we all need a Pam in our lives. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, thank you so much. I think some of your, um, some of the things that you do. Uh, one, I've got two quick, I've got two more questions, actually. One um, is what would be your top five top three or top five activities to do with your team um and how do you how do you manage that if not everybody wants to take part because I, I know that sometimes some of the stress relieving activities people could be taken out of their comfort zone a little bit couldn't they and not yeah. so how how do you manage that in your team on a you know on a weekly basis um so definitely you know everybody's different and um I always try, especially when we have new people coming in, finding what they like. So then I can kind of like connect it with everybody else. 
Um, so, for example, one thing for me is uh, reading books. I love reading books. Um, and I found that, uh, you know, almost uh, everybody in the room I work with uh, love it, enjoy reading too, but they enjoy different type of genres. Um, so that was something that we could talk about. This is something, uh, you know, like in the icebreaker game was like the true, uh, the one true and three lies. Like, because we talk with each other, we were able to be like, okay, now this is a lie and that's the true. So it get, it get the conversation going, get them to know, um, it gets yourself to know the staff and uh, the other way around as well. Um, and do you set specific times every week? Do you set, do you have time in your diary that you put aside looking at some of the things Pam was saying? Do you actually have set times each week where you say, right, we're going to play a game or we're going to talk about the books we're reading? Do you actually diarise that? Um, so we have, uh, every month we have uh, the weekly, uh, every two weeks we have, no, sorry. So every month we have two meetings. Uh, the main one that is at the end of the month, and in there we talk about the activities we want to do in the next month. And we choose a book where we can find ideas for activities from it. And then we have uh, um, a second one that is just the toddler room unit. Uh, and that's preschool as well. And in there, we talk a bit more about what we want to happen in the room. Um, so for example, one thing we've been doing now is uh, we started using a, an app. So we've been talking through that. We've been doing trainings through that. We've talked how, of how everybody's feeling with that. Um, so that's like our moment to talk with each other. And then uh, another thing that was very good for me uh, was creating a weekly chat with my deputy, uh, with my deputy uh, practitioner, deputy team leader. Um, that help us to find what we got to do through the week. So what needs to be happening and what we could do to help it happening. And then it's just a little, you know, feedback between me and her about the staff and the children and what has gone well in the week and what has not gone well. Because then uh, we can talk about it in the meeting and we can talk about it with each individual staff. So as Pam was saying, if you notice something is wrong, I could then talk to my deputy and say, oh, have you noticed this about this person? And if she comes back to me saying, ah, you know what, I was going to talk to your body, I, I noticed that, then I can go straight um, to, to, you know, talking to that person and saying, oh, um, are you okay? Is there anything you need? Uh, is there, do you need somebody to talk to? So that's been yeah. very... Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Pam, you've Emma, that's been, yeah, that's been fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing everything um, with us and what you do. Um, we do have one, uh, we do have one, I think this one, I think this one is for, um, for Pam, actually. Um, just bear with me. Do you want to yeah. ask Gail, are you happy to? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Pam, I'm wondering if you can, um, if you can help. Um, somebody's saying that she's been feeling quite overwhelmed recently um, as a nursery manager. Mm. I feel I'm on call all the time. Yeah. I know it's my fault just not putting down boundaries. Um, yeah. Stall and parents will email me during the weekend and I will indeed answer. In general, mm. it's made me think perhaps I want to be an assessor instead of being a manager due to its stresses, mm. but I'm slightly worried I'm acting on impulse. I do mm. suffer from clinical depression and, and anxiety. So somebody's mm. clearly, um, clearly needs some assistance here. Yeah. Absolutely, I, I get it. I, I, I honestly get it. Um, and I would encourage you not to step down. There are many things you can do uh, to start bringing that back. Um, and one of them obviously is a clear need for boundary setting. Um, I mean, if you want to contact me afterwards, you're most welcome to, and I'll spend some time with you and we can go through everything uh, that you feel local. That's great. If not, we'll do it by Zoom. Um, but there are strategies that will help you. Um, I, I promise you, there's light at the end of the tunnel, but you cannot carry on like that when you have all that input, all that stress. You're never far from work because you've been contacted in the, in the weekends as well, when you're not even probably coping with things at home. Um, no, that, that is a recipe for disaster, but there is, there is a solution. And I firmly believe that. So please, uh, Gail, please pass on my details. Well, uh, I'd, I'd love to spend some time with you. Thank you so much, Pan. 
Yeah, it's quite heartbreaking, isn't it? I think so many mm-hmm. practitioners are so overwhelmed with all the different mm-hmm. extra criteria, everything you have to do extra, and to yeah. try and keep everybody safe, the kids, the, you know, keep the parents mm-hmm. happy at the same mm-hmm. time, plus, yeah. you know, your own staff's well-being. So I think it is a difficult time the sector's going through with also with funding and all the crisis. Of, you know, everybody's under a lot of pressure. So, yeah. you know, thank you so yeah. much. And I wanted to say thanks to you it's and Emma as well. You guys have been brilliant. So thank you so much from thank my you. side and, and obviously yeah. Team Parenta for doing our, you know, webinar with us today. It's been fantastic to see you guys and, uh, share your wisdom with us and also from Emma's side as a practitioner you know actually what is happening in the in the workplace itself I can open the floor just quickly if anybody has any questions or have any experiences that they have if they want to share it uh, you can take yourself off mute if you wanted to I'll open it if not then forever hold your peace in that case I will say thanks so much guys and I will see you guys all on the next one